Well, you know, I can't just go launching right into a sermon without saying hello. It's so good to be here with you guys. I just, I, you know, I want to stand up here and clap for y'all. I mean, <laughs> you survived me 25 years ago. That, uh, you know, the, our years in Winona were some that we have enjoyed the most of our lives. And, um, you know, you helped raise my children. Many of you taught them the lessons of God. And, uh, you know, it's just such a special place in our hearts. Um, just a quick update on everybody. Laura's doing well. She had knee surgery about a month ago, but she's just perking right along. She's now come off her crutches and uh, is uh, doing well. Um, uh, all three children decided that they should get married during the pandemic. <laughs> uh, so, uh, believe it or not, Mary Evelyn, the one that was born while we were here, was the first to be married. She was married back in April. All we had was a, was a little two immediate families together in our backyard, officiated by, by me, and, uh, you know, had a beautiful wedding there, got to know the groom's families just really well because it was such an intimate setting. Uh, but she wanted to have the party later on. So August the 1st, Benjamin married. Then August the 14th, Mary Evelyn had her big blowout and reaffirmation of vows, and Catherine got married on September the 12th. It was about the busiest seven weeks we've had. <laughs> but they're all doing well, and some of you, the, the news has already preceded me. Ben and his wife, Brooke, are expecting in March. So that's an exciting thing coming up uh, for us. Pray for us. Uh, include that in your prayers as you move forward. Of course, we're, we keep abreast of some of the news of, of folks here in town. Continue to pray for Olivia Billingsley Leo, uh, for example, and many of you that we see uh, and hear about um, through various reports from the community. Now, one interesting thing is uh, in medical school, uh, Benjamin came across Anna, Bowles, uh, who was nursing, and then uh, discovered this, this year that over the last four or five years, he's been in the operating room with Lisa Allman and didn't even know who she was. <laughs> but she's been his operating nurse there uh, in the operating room, and that uh, was really a fun connection for them to make. And they even came up with a picture of Lisa's wedding and the officiant there who had much darker hair uh, back then. But again, they're all doing well, and it's so good to be here with you. We will never forget our days here in Winona. So let's uh, take a look at this passage that Jeanette uh, this morning. Um, mainly the verse that I will be spinning off of is that sixth verse. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let me ask, uh, some of you might remember this. I remember this from when my kids were kids. Do you remember the Where's Waldo books? Yeah, you probably may even still, do you still have books at home? I, I guess you do these days. <laughs> Um, but where's Waldo? If you don't remember, Waldo was this little stick figure kind of fella that uh, had on this striped sweater and a hat, as I remember. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, he was on every page in this book, but you had to find him. Because on every page of the book that he was in, there were about a hundred other small little people that were drawn into the picture. And the whole idea was to find Waldo. Well, many of us spend our lives looking for Waldo. In some sense, life is a where's Waldo sort of game. But you may not even be sure of who or what you are looking for. You may not know exactly what it is that you are seeking, but perhaps it might include that you're seeking acceptance by or love from or relationships with both God and other people. 
Sometimes there's this gnawing or craving inside that just won't go away. Sometimes it's a hole that just won't be filled. I don't know. Maybe you haven't grown up in a household of faith where going to church was easy because that's just what you did. Maybe you have, but you still have lots of unanswered questions that you're preparing for when you get to see God and get to ask all those questions. I have my own list. Maybe you find that sometimes faith and the things of faith are just kind of hard to be believable. Maybe you just haven't arrived yet. Maybe you've just gotten lazy, or maybe you've given up, which is easy to do when you fall into a routine in your life and you don't have the answers. Or maybe you've hit a new stage in your life, like retirement, and you're still trying to figure it out. Whatever. Whatever it is that you're seeking, whatever stage that you're in, maybe you've been a seeker all your life. There's a seeker in all of us. You know, many of you know that over the last 15 years or so, I've been working for a firm based in Nashville called Ministry Architects. People ask me from time to time, well, what kind of buildings do you build? And I say, we don't build buildings. We build ministries. And we do that by going and visiting in churches over a three-day period and, and help them evaluate what some of their strengths are and some of the things they need to work on and what our recommendations might be. We do that with... Uh, in churches and even in denominational regions like right now I'm working with the new Tennessee Western Kentucky Conference to help them build their youth ministry for the coming years as they start this new annual conference. So the first thing we do is we go in and we do this assessment and then we uh, help them to develop a vision for how they might move forward. And then we work with them over maybe a two-year or three-year period to help them implement what those plans look like. But similarly, if you're trying to build up your faith or go deeper in your faith, you have to do some of the same types of things. The first thing you have to do is you have to face the truth about your spiritual life, where you are in your spiritual life. Come to some sense of, well, if the spiritual life is on a scale of 1 to 10, well, maybe I'm a 5? Is that where I want to be? Face the truth about your spiritual life. Second, see a pathway forward. Third, take a next step. So, how do you face the truth. How do you know where you are? Nobody knows you better than you. You know when life is great. You know when life is empty. You know when life, when it all seems to come together. You know when something's missing. You know when you're being honest and when you're pretending. But we're not always interested in facing the truth when life is empty or when we're feeling less than our best. The truth about us individually can be in for affirming. There are times when the me uh, that I am, I'm, I'm proud to be. But the truth can also be difficult because every once in a while there is that me I hope no one sees. What we need is someone in our lives who can help us name and claim the truth about who we are. There have been some helpful instruments through the world, particularly in psychological circles. You can take the Myers-Briggs inventory or you can assess your life through the Enneagram or something else like that. But what about spiritually? 
How are we going to come to the point of facing our spiritual selves? One of the things that I do with ministry architects is I help churches discover their discipleship pathways. What's a discipleship pathway? Well, a discipleship pathway is kind of a description of how a person kind of begins in a spiritual journey and then kind of describes what it looks like until they come to a destination. You know, every church has a different idea of what that looks like, so every description of a discipleship pathway that we do with a local church is different from every other church. But every individual also has an idea of what this spiritual journey might look. Think about in education. How how many of you are or have been educators? I can point at you if you don't raise your hand. Yeah, there's some of you in here who've been, you know that in uh, an educational experience, you have certain ideas of what, Young people should know when they get to certain points in their educational journey. There are milestones that we use to evaluate where they are in that educational journey. You want to know if they know how to multiply by the time they get to what grade? Third, maybe, third grade, learn how to multiply. They ought to know uh, the preamble to the Constitution when they're at a certain, well, I forgot it. But there are certain things that you hope that they will know at certain points along the way, right? The same thing is true of the spiritual journey. You might even take some some little markers that you might say, well, I would expect that children would know the Lord's Prayer by the time they're five years old. Or that they might know the Apostles' Creed by the time they get to be seven. Or that they would know the books of the Bible by the time they are 16. Would any of y'all like to take that test? But there are certain things that we hope people will know and feel and do as they move along that spiritual journey. And how would you evaluate that? It's all about facing who we are in order that God might do something new and better in us. Some of these things I'm facing I like. Some of these things I'm facing I'm not so happy with. But it's a place to start being honest with yourself about where you are spiritually. You hope to move forward, but the reverse is possible. You can also forget who you are. So remember who you are. And don't be afraid to face the truth. (coughs) Pardon me. Secondly, face the truth. That's first. Secondly, see a path. Having an idea about a discipleship pathway is a good help here. The world is wide open for the modern seeker with many, many paths from which they might choose. And where we encounter difficulty is in seeing the past. The, the path. I have this picture of the me that I want to be. But that's where I want to go. Is that where I'm supposed to go? Where I want to go? What we need is a guide. It's not about the me that I want to be. It's about the me that God wants me to be. The path can be elusive. I can remember one time uh, when Benjamin was about four years old, He and I went on a day hike. We were day hiking. The group that we were day hiking with was spending the night, but he was a bit young. And we had the family dog. Some of you might remember Sandy. We had the family dog, and um, we were doing fine, except the fact that at the end of the day, we left a little bit later than we maybe should have. 
We were in the Sipsi Wilderness up in North Alabama. And, um, and, you know, I had this four-year-old and, you know, I began to get a little bit worried because it was getting dark and we were still at least a mile from the uh, parking lot where our vehicle was. And then I began to listen. I couldn't, the trail was disappearing in front of me. And Benjamin was in front of me. I was kind of watching out for him. But I could hear Sandy, maybe 30 feet out in front of us, her little collar, her little rabies tag jingling on the pathway. And I knew that if I could just follow that sound, Sandy would lead us home. We all need a guide like that because the pathway can be elusive. We can lose the trail if we're not careful. How many times have you said to yourself, if I could just get to a better place? That's what we say when we're seeking higher ground. That's where we want to go is to higher ground. But it's not just knowing where you're going. You also need a way to get there the path, what's the route that you're going to take? What does the destination look like at the end of the road? What are the stops that you will make along the way? Lord, show me the path to that higher place, or at least to my next place. Then we have to take a step. Face the truth, see the path, take a step. There's an important first step if you are seeking higher ground. Take a first step. I had to face that as I was exercising. I, I was telling Henry about this a little bit earlier in my neighborhood, we, we have lots of woods and trees and fallen trees and firewood uh, easily available to us. And every once in a while, we'll gather around a bonfire with a number of our neighbors. And this one particular night, I looked around the circle, and it looked like I was sitting in front of a former offensive line from somebody's college football team. But they weren't in college football shape anymore. They were struggling a bit. A couple of them still can't get around very well. They're struggling with their knees. I had put on some weight myself, and I said, I'm not going here. How do I change the path that I'm on? So I told my jogging neighbor, who I admired, that he was my inspiration. He's a few years younger than me, but you know, fairly close to my age. I said, I, I can't run the way that you do, but I'm starting to walk. He said, just do something. That's what you need to do. You have to make yourself get out the door. Now, maybe that's you. Maybe, maybe it's not about exercise. Maybe it's something about your business, or, or maybe it's something in your spiritual life. But the whole idea is to get out the door. Take a first step. Or if you need a little more basic motivation uh, if, to exercise or, or an equivalent version of it, you know, get your exercise clothes on. Or, David, get out of bed. Or, David, open your eyes. Or, wake up, wake up, wake up. The fellow who owns Ministry Architects' name is Mark DeVries. And one of Mark's favorite little phrases is, eat the frog. Now, I don't know. I've never done that. Catherine is our frog person. But, um, but he says, eat the frog. The frog is that thing that gets put on your desk that you know you need to take care of. But if you don't take care of it, you go away from your desk and you come back and it's grown. Or maybe it's had babies. 
And so that frog that you could have eaten a while ago, it's gotten bigger. It's gotten worse. The problem's doubled in size. So eat the frog. Sometimes the frogs are tough to swallow. If you're supposed to be studying, eat the frog. Do that thing you don't want to do, but know you need to do. Just take a step, any step, toward higher ground. Lord, tell us the truth. Show us the path. Give us steps to take. There's a song about it. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.